here's the question I have for you as someone that was in, immersed in that environment. What is so enticing about this ideology? What is it that just sucks people who are smart people into yeah. it? It is a, um, I'm going to steal from uh, Mike Nina, who I had on my channel a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago. He, he's a filmmaker in Australia, and he came out with the first and probably the most e uh, readily accessible Evergreen State College documentary. And it's in three parts, and you should check it out if you just want the the short version. Um, my version is different. Um, but he talks about this ideology as uh, kind of like a virus that attaches itself to the caring receptors. And that's what it really does. Mm. It, it bypasses your brain. It, it has nothing to do with your thought processes. It um, it it very much calls upon and and I'm going to say something, and I don't mean this offensively at all. But in aggregate, women have certain sorts of orientations towards the world, which are very good at uh, attending to the raising of individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that has to do with a very strong motherly bond and a, and a caring relationship where, where, you, uh, where the, the woman processes her, facilitates caring in order to, to create children. And I, I see it a lot in, uh, in a pattern of behavior called I'm sorry, I don't mean this derogatorily, and I'm having a problem with this word. There's this Karen meme, and there's this uh, there's this high propensity of of women to be possessed by this ideology really quickly, and a lot of very empathetic men too, and and I, I'm a very empathetic man too, so I I would I would interact with it, but have a very strong negative reaction to it because I I felt that it was parasitizing my caring. By infantilizing the, uh, the 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 marginalized, it it turns them into infants that then you then go and you care for. And a lot of oh. Robin D'Angelo, and this is this is kind of an archetypal. I'm a poet, so I rely on poetic reasoning. There's this um, twisted kind of motherliness that's going on in her. Um, I'm going to care for you. I know how to care for you. It's this very consuming mother, this very clutching mother. And I saw that um, a lot of academic females who didn't have children for one reason or another, then uh, cause the cause the students to become children and then completely guard them like a mother would from any sort of criticism. So if you look at how the world reacted to Evergreen was very strongly negative because of the way that the students were acting. And the professors, the professors who more or less put them up to that, kind of circled the wagons and coddled them and, and gave them attention and, and supported them in a way that actually shielded them from actually examining why those ideas caused their behavior, why their behavior is wrong, and why their behavior is actually not just wrong in, you know, like a just a human being acting sense, but destructive to the entire project of learning, of gaining a skill, and so on. I mean, I actually never thought about it in that way before. So they are very literally finding a way to mother these populations. And and isn't it funny that a lot of these people, and I'm going to make a broad generalization, but but I'm probably going to stand behind it. Um, a lot of the women that I see doing this don't actually have kids. There's this interesting, there's this interesting dynamic. Um, I think, I, I I think there's a circuitry that that is preying upon that that women human beings are really similar. Like I have that same circuitry too, but women have a more propensity to do that. And, and it's almost like if one hasn't uh, gone through the steps of having a child and raising the child, that, that circuitry is dormant, but it's just waiting to be triggered. And this stuff just flips it into mm -hmm. overgear um, or into high gear. And because it's based on identity politic, there's these really weird currents of, uh, you know, the, like, like it, it becomes incredibly racist in its superior. I'm, I'm, I'm the white savior of the world. I, I'm like a white Jesus, where I can take the suffering of all mankind upon my shoulders and deliver you to salvation. Just listen to me, bow to you. Just watch me uh, wash your feet. Watch me bow unto you, and and say that I need to give up all of my resources for you because of you know the, the bad father that that has raped and pillaged this whole land, unjustly built all these buildings and, and constructed this wonderful economy upon upon stolen land or whatever. You know? mm -hmm. 
Now, in, in your series, you really focus in on Naima Lowe as yeah. kind of one of the chief um, protagonists, I suppose, in this yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. But so so give me a little bit more background on that, because, well, you yeah. go ahead. <laughs> OK, well, I, I there's there's ethical problems to telling this story because, you know, okay. I, I basically try to see the humanity in everybody and all the actors, you know, like George Bridges is probably kind of the chief like bad guy in my mind of this whole debacle like a very weak leader is just the worst it's it's worse than a tyrant because he's everything's it's it's tyranny but it's it's passive aggressive tyranny um so i do want to reserve the fact that i'm uh i i've studied naima low by her behavior and i'm sure that there's causes for this behavior that could be accessed and, and understood in terms of mental health and in terms of, uh, you know, just wayward uh, intentions. But she, the, the Evergreen State College is set up in such a way that it can facilitate very deep, close relationships between professors and students. You don't take, when in the typical quarter, you don't take, you know, your math and then your biology and then a writing course. You take one program that has all these components in it. So conceivably, you could take one course that would last the entire year with two or three professors and, and really get into the material and form really deep bonds. Naimalo uh, taught, I guess, uh, cultural, uh, well, no, media studies, I guess. And I, I would see her teach because I worked in the media department and I would, you know, facilitate her, her workshops and stuff just with regarding filmmaking. I, I was a literature student, but I ended up making films at the end of this. And and she was a film student who, or film teacher who I never took. I didn't take any courses from her, but it's interesting. So there's this kind of parallel dynamic between here's somebody who professes to be a master of this form, uh, creating creating art that I think is very subpar and is justified in its atrociousness, like literal atrociousness, because of a twisted form of postmodern, uh, a postmodern conception of, of of destroying and dismantling everything that is excellent and beautiful in the world, um, and in this twisted kind of vengeance upon upon culture or something. I don't I don't, I don't really understand it. Um, or I guess we could just kind of go around and and if you look at her art, it, it's very obsessed with being ugly. And one thing that she produced at one point was called 39 Questions for White People. And in the video that I ended up making uh, her, specifically about her uh, in the Complete Evergreen Story, it's episode 15, I think. Uh, it's got like a very uh, different ti uh, title from everything else. And what I did conceptually was I took like cheesy, pretentious college uh, college media student styles of just like throwing everything in there and being really ostentatious with all the styles and the editing and like super uh, cheesily produced um, to really. And then I, I cut up and I spliced and I, I used her material to deconstruct her ideology. And in that video, I frameworked it around 39 questions for white people. And she just, it seemed like she's very obsessed with, uh, whiteness as this entity that was always restraining her, always, you know, kind of dictating the world in a very Gnostic fashion. It's like there's this there's this dark god. And and just a subnote, certain strains of feminism have developed a similar idea of patriarchy as this dark god that's controlling everything behind the scenes that needs to be constantly dismantled, which is a very Gnostic, which is a ancient religion kind of you conceive the world as constructed by a god that that it has bad intentions for us, and you have to constantly become aware through these meditation and these chants and this gnosis, right? This you you become aware of it, and and critical theory as applied to race does that with whiteness. Certain strains of feminism do that with with regards to patriarchy, and if you actually look at Naima Lowe's life, she's always been in a privileged environment. She's always, it, it seems to me, and I don't have the documents on this, but I have had other people that know her, that she's always been in an environment where she was the only black person uh, surrounded by white people. And the oh. way that she could stand out and capitalize on that was to make the race issue like the central way of, uh, of relating to one another. And I do have uh, you know, eyewitness accounts from 
people who worked with her in the capacity of teaching. And she would, she was very much a bully. She was always controlling uh, whatever meeting she was in and doing a lot of demands and leaning on people. And, pe- and a lot, there was just a lot of just kind of allowing her to do that and not standing up against her because she is just her, you know, and, uh, and it just kind of reached a critical mass when, uh, there was two young black men who were shot in 2015, which is another key moment in the story. And she, they were shot because they were shoplifting and then they attacked a police officer with their skateboards and, and all that stuff is ignored because they're black and they got shot by the police. That was the only narrative that really made sense. Um, and that's when you have this, this facilitating event that, that justifies the outburst that we see with, with George Floyd. There's this one emblematic event that just, uh, is just the, the tender that completely ignites the, the silo in a way. And uh, and what happened right before the protests was that the two young black men were actually uh, what, what's the correct word? They were um, sentenced. They were they were punished, but they, they were they were found guilty of assault. And the, the police officer was was excused for for what he did. And then these two young black men uh, who were caught up in the systemic system who have no responsibility on their own for their own actions were unjustly accused by the system of, you know, uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and unfortunately uh, assaulting a police officer, which, you know, yeah, just happens. Just happens. So they, they were found guilty. And then that kind of, that kind of, uh, was another aspect of her losing it. Um, I think I can, what what confuses me is I don't understand why she she gained so much power because she seemed to just flout everything about the system. Like I mean, I, there was um you know I remember uh, the the faculty meeting. She said I don't even come to these faculty meetings because you all are racist and all and all this stuff. And you know in 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 my life I kind of try to keep myself a little purposefully naive sometimes because I think it helps me to lead a more happy existence honestly than if Hmm. myself to to get sunk into these things and and i'm equating that back to this because i don't understand why people are so attracted to people who are just overtly negative Mm -hmm. in their actions towards other people what kind of made her what made her so powerful in this scenario it is it's it's the system of thought it it completely owes to this network of ideas that have been kind of evolutionarily sculpted by being kind of argued over and over again in the academy. And it, and it has to do with grievance studies or critical theory, uh, which I couldn't really give you a, a salient, uh, you know, blow by blow on them. My brain doesn't work that way. But if you see, and I've tried to reconstruct this in the footage from prior seminars, you just... You see the implementation of this idea that we live in an unjust society and that everybody, the the individual's behavior doesn't really matter. The individual act of racism doesn't really matter because the racism in our society is systemic. It's behind the scenes. And so if somebody, and you see this in the footage when one of the lead protesters, Jamil, and uh, and uh, Shamerica, and then a couple the the lead protesters are in the room with George Bridges, and they're giving him demands, and they're eating pizza and talking about how oppressed they are. And they're like, you know what? It doesn't matter if they did anything wrong. It's that the fact that we say that we feel unsafe, you should fire these people because we feel unsafe. That should be enough for you because we are here, and it's not our job to be doing this right now. This is your job. This is your work that you should be doing because we are oppressed. Mm-hmm. You know. They they seem so obsessed with um with money with the fact that that people get paid to do those labor, jobs yeah. and 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 getting paid for their own emotional labor and I mean they seem to go after everyone who who has a job there I mean one of the things I found most shocking was the the cafeteria worker the cook who they descended upon um I don't know what is that main kind of cafeteria called it's called the greenery but it's the cafeteria yeah it's probably racist now oh i'm sure it's it's greenery it's racist can't have that but they all descended on the greenery and and i guess after like right around the time it was closing and just demeaned this poor cook 
for not making them their food fast enough and not letting them into the fridge themselves and felt completely justified in doing it. Yeah. 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 There's it, it mobilizes. This is one of my uh, hypotheses about this set, this network of ideas that we're all going to just have to swallow now is that what it does is that it, it preys upon people's care, their concern, right? It also preys upon niceness and politeness. Mm-hmm. And people who are very polite and nice and conscientious just defer to it. Like, well, I don't want to be mean. You're, you're saying that if I say this thing, it's actually a mean thing. I don't want to, I don't want to be mean. So I, I'll, I'll give you my, it starts with controlling your language. I think Jordan Peterson was right. Okay, I'll, I'll just put my, my pronouns out there. Not understanding that, that once you destabilize right. pronouns, you can then go on to destabilize sex and gender and then start to play some really interesting games with sex and gender once you force the nice people to say, oh, well, it's rude you know, for me to not go along with your idea. Um, and, but also, well, okay, well, it's, it's rude. It's not nice for me to if, – if you're saying that I'm racist, that's not something that I want to be because racism isn't nice. So I guess I am racist. So – I just, I don't really understand your experience. So me asking you to think clearly, to calm down and to make an argument, that's actually me oppressing you. Right. Right. Because they can't be expected to control themselves and act like adults. No. No, No, because they're children. They, they, They are children and they come from a more authentic culture. And you see this, it's incredibly racist. It's incredibly racist. They go on, there's a, there's one little moment in one of the found footage and it's actually just audio where this student is so enraged at Brett Weinstein. He says, stop using reason and logic and white forms of knowledge to control this conversation or to do something like that. And, and okay, so reason and logic are white forms of knowledge. So we should not expect anybody other than white people to be nice, to be civil, to be logical, right? This, this is incredibly, so, so it, it's so egregiously racist that you that the nice person can't even say that they're like well this doesn't seem right but you're saying i'm going to be nice and i'm going to let this happen what that facilitates is people who don't give a shit about being nice Uh which i would describe as narcissistic sociopaths people with no conscientiousness to then start to game the system whether they're white or black like like they they understand that now i can control this is this is a this is a method of destroying the checks and balances in a community that restrain the narcissistic sociopaths from taking it over like Mm -hmm. like where where personal responsibility and meritocracy are what is the most valued thing in any that's the that's the positive feedback loop that that's how we grade whether or not we you know like your contribution is is worthwhile now that's not the case now it's that you have to you have to prove that you are oppressed or are fighting for the oppressed, which mm-hmm. is now it's it's so it's so diffuse. It's completely unmoored from factual act, actual like I was oppressed in this very instant. No, I was descendant from a, an oppressed minority, or I have a uh, oppressed personality of some sort, right. or I'm fighting for the oppressed people. So that's 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 what we're going to see, and it's going to take effect in different. In different ways and different organizations, but that's my hypothesis. That well, what we have lost is our ability to restrain the worst.